Nothing Fancy, Part 2 in my Philosophy of Use, Mobility versus Firepower video. And I'm using the Germans' World War II Tiger One tank as an example of firepower. And it's not all good. Yes, we talked about how awesome the 88mm gun was. It could knock out any Allied tank. Pretty much stayed that way throughout the whole war. World War II, that is. But it was heavy, and that heavy that heavy weight came at a price, and that was reduced range. 37 miles cross-country on the road, a whopping 62 miles. Wow. Is that a big deal? You bet it's a big deal. It basically invalidated, in my opinion, the Tiger Tank from being a viable weapon. Because the Tiger Tank was not always functioning in a tank versus tank role. Here's a T-3485. It wasn't always going against another tank. In fact, it rarely, I wouldn't say rarely, but it wasn't a frequent occurrence to go tank versus tank. It was a very frequent occurrence for it to function in the infantry support role. And just when the infantry needed the, needed the Tigers the most, maybe going into a town that was heavily entrenched with enemy troops, the Tigers needed to go gas up, and they had to leave their formations of infantry. That wasn't good. And it was even worse if that infantry came across other armor, whether it was Sherman's or Soviet T-34 T tanks. Because the, the, you know the Tiger would drop out of the fight, had to go gas up frequently. Not only that, along with that short range came a, a long string of logistics following the Tiger tank. Because, because it needs so much gas, it's going to have to have fuel trucks, technicians, following along to make sure that that gas can be delivered to the weapon system, the Tiger tank. Huge disadvantage. Also, it was so heavy to recover. If a Tiger tank got knocked out in battle, you know, good luck recovering it. It was so heavy, you know, that 121,000 pounds, the only way you could do it is pretty much hook up two other Tiger tanks and tow it clear. And that's if the battle field allowed it. You know, sometimes the battlefield wouldn't allow you to recover the Tiger tank. Um, it was just heavy. That weight had some big disadvantages. How about transporting the Tiger? I'll show you this other one. Well, transporting it wasn't easy either. In order to put it on the railroad cars and to even get it to the Russian front, they had to take out these outer bogey wheels here and take the tread off. And that was a lot of work requiring technicians and man hours. And even then, it barely fit onto the train car. That's a big disadvantage. Also, it was more complex. This interleaved bogey system, the track, the hydraulic system for the traverse, the gun, the whole system as a whole needed highly skilled mechanics to keep it running. And it was noted for sometimes having some problems. And if you didn't have that highly skilled mechanic nearby, guess what? You just lost your weapon system. Out of the battle. Back to the suspension system, this interleaved bogey wheel suspension system, not so great because in the Russian front, if that got caked with water and slush and then they parked it overnight, these bogey wheels would freeze up. I mean, I'm talking totally freeze up. They couldn't even move the tank. They would have to heat it with fire, knock it out with picks, and basically knock out all the ice on the interleaved suspension system to make it functional. Notice the Russian design, the T-34, didn't have that. It was a Christie-style suspension system. Christie being an American tank designer, they adapted his designs to their tanks, and it worked. No interleaving of the wheels there, and therefore they wouldn't freeze together in the snow and slush. Complex to repair, the T Tiger One was. Yeah, it had great armor, great gun, and it was very good in the ambush, as proven by Michael Whitman. But also it had a bad transmission. Sometimes that Maybach gearbox, 8-speed gearbox in there, would totally shred out. So that required more maintenance. Then it was heavy for bridges. You come across a bridge, the question they'd have to ask is, can it support a 121,000-pound Tiger tank? The answer was frequently no. Therefore, they had to ford the river. That was a harrowing experience in itself. Tiger tank was a formidable weapon. Make no 
mistake about it. If and when it reached the battlefield, and if and when it reached in significant numbers under competent leadership, the Tiger tank enjoyed a 20 to 1 kill ratio against tanks. Against anti-tanks is about 15 to 1. But it was unreliable in a lot of ways. They, uh, they say uh, in 1944 of the 150 tanks in the Eastern Front, i.e. in Russia, only 50% of them were serviceable. That kind of sucks. What good is a weapon system if it's not reliable? You know? Yeah, it was potent. I mean, Malinova, uh, Russia, um, 17 Soviet tanks were taken out uh, with just a couple, I think a pair of Tiger tanks. And those were T-3485s and JS-1 Stalins. So, yeah, very capable weapon system. So, Tiger definitely had some limitations. It represents, in Nut and Fancy's opinion, a good example of firepower with the usual and incumbent drawbacks. Did the Russians ever get it right? I'm sorry, the Germans? You bet they did. They actually had another tank. It was called the Stug. The Sturmgewitz. I can't speak German. Men's assault gun. The Sturmgewitz. I'll call it the Stug 3. This is an example of a Stug 3. This actually wasn't... It wasn't a tank. It was a, a, an assault gun designed by the Germans back in the 1930s. And it was one of their most produced tanks. And it was one of their most successful tanks. And I'm using the word tank, but that's really a misnomer. It was an assault gun. What's an assault gun? Well, it was a, a, a self-propelled artillery piece designed to accompany the infantry and accompany, accompany them in their assaults. That's what the Stug III was designed to be. I think over 8,000 of them were made during the war. In 1944 and 1945, almost 5,000 were made. So it was widely produced and widely used throughout the entire period of World War II by the Germans. What did the Stug III have that the, that the Tiger didn't? Well, one, it was economical to make. It, didn't, it wasn't that expensive. Notice it does not have a turret. As an assault gun, that was the current philosophy of the Germans, that we don't need a turret for our assault gun. It makes it easier to make and more economical. We, and in time of war, when... Raw materials are very limited. It behooves us to simplify, heard that word before from nothing fancy, simplify our design. And the Stug 3 is a perfect example of that simplification. No turret, an existing Panzerkampfwagen 3 chassis right here already existed. They didn't have to design a new one. And that resulted in a very reliable and simple weapon system, the Stug 3 amazingly reliable. So while this while the Tiger 1 and that's if they even had a Tiger 1 available while it was running back to go get refueled in the heat of the battle leaving the infantry completely exposed without armor the Stug 3 was right beside them the whole fight. That's because it just had a lot more range than the Tiger and actually a lot of other tanks in the war. Couple that with its very low profile. The Stug 3 was very short. And that made it an excellent ambush weapon. They could throw some foliage on top of it, some netting, hide it in a barn house, hide it along a hedgerow, and the allies would be none the wiser. Even after it started firing. It was hard to spot because the thing was freaking tiny. The Stug was. It was hard to see. Very, And it was hard to hit. When you have a low profile like the Stug... You know, especially if it's moving, good luck trying to hit it. It's hard. And it had good armor. Now, the armor wasn't as stout as a Tiger, but it wasn't bad. 50 millimeter in the front, if I'm not mistaken. About 50, 45, 43 millimeters on the side. It could have done a better job sloping the armor. You can see it's pretty much, there's a slight angle to it. Sloped armor helps deflect the shot. You'll see that on the T-34. That was one of the advantages of the T-34, by the way, is you can look at its turret, and it was very cutting edge this way. They sloped it so when the shot impacts, it's deflected upwards. Also on the front glass ship plate, also angled. Pretty much every side of the T-34 is angled to deflect the shot. Another reason why it was hard to knock out. Very excellent tank, the T-34. Back to the Stug, though. 
It also had a good gun. Was it the 88 that the Tiger had? Nope. It was a 75 millimeter Stuke 3, I think, L48. That was in the version G of the Stuke 3. But it was very high velocity, very capable. Could knock out most Allied armor. Couple that with a reliable motor, a 300 horsepower Maybach. I think it was like an HL120 V12. And I know a lot of you guys just don't care about these details, but I have to throw them in because there's going to be guys watching this that if I don't get it right, they're going to call me on it. But I'll get it right. And it was pretty fast. 28 miles an hour on the road, the Stug 3 would cruise. wasn't like screaming fast, but guess what? In 1943, actually 1941, 2, 43, 44... That was fast enough. Kept up with whatever was going on on the battlefield. The Stug 3 did. Cross country wasn't super fast. About 12 miles an hour. But guess what? It was there. And there's a lot to be said for that. What do I mean by there? It means there were a lot of them. And that meant that chances are a German infantry, platoon, brigade, whatever, company, division, probably had access to a couple Stugs for their assault. And that meant that it was a viable weapon system. What do I mean by that? Well, again, like I said with the Tiger, if it's out busted, or if it's out getting refueled, who cares how tough of a weapon system it is? It's not available to you to use as a commander. You're getting the picture now, ain't you? I don't care how powerful that 88 millimeter gun is, how thick that armor plating is if it's gone from the battlefield and it's not an option for me to use as a commander whereas a simple stug like this one is ready to rock and roll not perfect in fact it had a lot of limitations with no turret it wasn't was not a tank and therefore in a fast run and gun tank versus tank battle the stug was at a disadvantage it more was more effective in the tank killer role, i.e. hidden, like I described, or in an ambush position. And also in the assault gun position. Working with infantry, going through a town, and they can tell the stew crew, hey, we've got a hardened point of resistance over there in that building. We need your gun. Take it out. Here's a stew 3 with the armor glass plates on the side. These were about, I don't know, a couple millimeters thick, designed to prematurely detonate any heat rounds and also help deflect shot. Looks pretty cool. Same tank, Stug, I think there's a G version. Super efficient tank. Germans should have concentrated on spitting more of these out if they were smart. And then later versions added this MG34 on the top so it had an anti-infantry capability as well because it was so inexpensive. But the Germans, specifically Hitler, was very fascinated by heavy armor. In fact, this wasn't enough. The Tiger I wasn't enough. He wanted more. And that's why the Super Tiger came about. The King Tiger. Here's a version of that. I hope you guys don't mind the models, but I think they're good visual aids. Extremely detailed and extremely realistic. It's like looking at the real thing in my book. Check that out. That was a that looked like an even more formidable tank. Amazing. Guess what? It was even heavier. 153,000 pounds. And they didn't do anything to the engine. In fact, they decreased the horsepower. They put an HL230 in there with only 600 horsepower. Remember, the engine in the Tiger I, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be, that was a 700 horsepower motor. So we're getting 100 less horsepower, and we're adding 30,000 more pounds. Does that sound like a problem to any of you guys? It should, because it's going to lead to less reliability, and that's exactly what cursed the King Tiger. It was not reliable. And it was slower. Had like a 23 mile an hour top speed on the road, 11 mile an hour cross country, and those were in the best of conditions. And it had a higher ground pressure, despite the even wider tracks. It was about 15 pounds per square inch where I forget what the the Tiger was. I think it was around 14, yeah, it was about 14.8, so not hugely more than the Tiger. But yeah, it was a very heavy tank. That overstressed the engine and the transmission. And yes, it led to reliability problems. 
Now it had some good things. It even had a more powerful 88 millimeter gun on it, which could again outrange and take out any Allied tank. The King Tiger could. But overall, it was slow, it was ponderous, it was expensive to produce. Hmm, that's important. Why? Because it meant that only 485 were ever made. Now granted, the King Tiger, the King Tiger's development cycle came late in the war when the Allies were bombing the heck out of the German industrial capacity, so it was all they could do to keep it in production. But the King Tiger stayed in production all the way until the signing, or the, the surrendering of Germany, believe it or not. They did a good job with it, but still, it was complex, expensive, big, ponderous, not effective as a weapon system. Does it represent firepower? You bet. The pinnacle of firepower. Let's talk a little bit about the Sherman tank, because the Allies won World War II. It wasn't the Germans. Here the Germans had all this amazing weaponry, the Stug III, the King Tiger, all versions of the Tiger I. Having talked about the Panther tank, probably the best all-around tank of World War II. I don't have time, but that also was a perfect example of firepower. What do you know? My time's up again. Tune in part three. I'll tie it all together. I promise you'll dig it. Nothing fancy.